right, let's all stand as we we'll sing page number 159. Blessed be the name, page 159. All praise to name of the Lord, his name above all names shall send, exalted more and more, and God the Father's own right hand, for angel hosts adore. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Verse number four, his name shall be the counselor, the mighty prince of peace, of all earth's kingdoms conqueror, whose reign shall never cease. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Good things evening. Turn to page number 364, page 364, standing on the promises, page number 364. Page number 364, here we go, ready? Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior, standing I'm standing. I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God. Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, I cannot fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior, He's my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. Sing it already. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises uh. All right, so we're standing on the promises, so give me a promise. I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. Hebrews 13, verse 5. All right, someone else, give me a promise. You'll never flood the earth again, found in Genesis chapter 9. Another promise. Come on now. 
Eternal life. Hey, uh, John chapter 10, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Give me another burn. Go to, pre- that's right, I'm coming back for you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. Miss Marta? Amen. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans chapter 10, verse 13. Somebody else? Yes, sir. Good. If, you, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. Brother Adam, that was going to be yours. All right. Somebody else. Come on now. Yes, ma'am. Amen. That's an awesome, that's an awesome verse. Uh, it's a blessing. I learned that as a youngster. Isaiah 41.10. Somebody else? Behind me. Yes, ma'am. He will always provide. David said, I'm young, now I'm old. Yet I'm not seen the righteous forsaken, nor a seed begging bread. Yes, over here, sir. That's right. There's only one way, and that's through Jesus Christ. Anybody else? Right up here. Someone up here. Miss Abby, is that you? Or David? Da- David. Abby's pointing to David. That's right. He says he'll provide living water. John chapter 4. He'll never thirst again. Sir? Amen. Praise the Lord for that. That's wonderful. That's John chapter 3, uh, verse 17, I think, right? 17, 18, somewhere in that next little All right. John chapter 3, sir? Amen. That's right. That's good. Anybody else? Don't want to leave somebody out. Yes, anybody else, sir? That's right. For by grace we say through faith that not of ourselves, the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should build. Yes, ma'am? Amen. Absolutely. Do God's promises fail? No, sir, he's going to keep every one of those. You know when you get discouraged and when you're going through a rough time in your life, you need to come back to some of the promises of God. You need to come back to some of the promises of God, and God will remind you, you can be reminding yourself that, hey, God has not forgotten me, okay? And not that he's forgotten us, he's not forgotten us individually, and uh, we need to remember and remind ourselves. That's what David did when David encouraged himself in the Lord. And there comes times when, when the preacher can't do it because he's not there or the spouse can't do it because she's sleeping or he's sleeping or whatever the case might be and, and you're just needing encouragement. That's when you pull out the promises of God and remember how good God is and the promises that he's made to you and to me individually and what a great God we have. Well, I'm glad to be in the Lord's house tonight. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to what God has for us. I'm going to ask Brother Doug if he'll come and close, uh, come and close us. <laughs> We're done already. Hey, serve's over. Uh, but if you'll come and, and, uh, and open our service in a word of prayer tonight, dear brother, come and pray. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for laughter and that you, you know how to laugh and that you have sense of humor, Father God, and help us to uh, maybe this week, if we have time during our study, go through the scriptures and see the places where it says that you laugh, Father God, and the things that you laugh about, human ambitions, our desires, our plans, We think we know a lot. We think we know it all. We think we know more than you, Father God. Father, we know nothing in your presence and in comparison to you. Help us to open our hearts in light of that, to receive your word for us tonight, to apply it to our lives this week. Bless the services, we pray, and all who couldn't be with with us here this evening. We ask and pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. You see, did just some announcements I want to remind us, everybody, about tonight. Uh, don't forget this. Uh, for, let's be praying for roundup, uh, around, uh, revival meeting coming up. I'm sorry, I've got about 45 things going through my brain right now. But we have a revival coming up October the 1st, and I, I hope that you'll mark your calendar and plan to be there at every one of the services. And uh, you say, well, I just, I got other things to do, and, and uh, things come up, and so on, and the Lord will help you with that, but, uh, uh, but plan to be here. You'll, you'll receive a blessing, you'll get a blessing, you'll be encouraged from the Word of God. It's an investment of time, and understand it, and, and view it in that way. It's an investment of time. I'm investing in my spiritual walk with God. 
And uh, as I look at things that way as an investment, I expect a return on investment. So when I come and I invest time in God's house, I expect that God will give me something in return. And I believe that God will if we'll look at it that way. And so, uh, so scratch the calendar, make things happen that you need to have happen so that you can be here. And uh, I know Brother Getch will be a blessing. And then please be praying for a revival meeting. Uh, revival doesn't come in a suitcase. It doesn't come in a satchel. Revival comes when God's people get our hearts right where they need to be with the Lord. And, uh, and God works in our, in our midst. And I, I'm thankful for that. Uh, you say, Pastor, you haven't passed out a bunch of flyers about revival meeting. I don't believe revival meeting is for uh, the community at large. I believe revival meeting is for us as individuals, as God's people. And when God God's people get right with God, then we can take the message of God to the people in the community, and uh, I believe that's what we need to do, and so you be praying about that if you would, and uh, pray that God speak to the preacher, and uh, pray that God speak through the preacher, and that God would speak to each one of us individually, and uh, I know that God can do uh, great and mighty things which we know not, and so I'm looking forward to that. And then uh, don't forget, be praying about the starting points class for those people that are, I think everybody here is all members now, I, I, we, have, we have one that's, that's visiting, we're glad you're here with us tonight, thanks again for coming back, and we appreciate that, but the starting points class is going to start next next Sunday morning at 9.30 for folks that are interested in knowing about the church and, and uh, willing to join the church. This is the third time I've had to teach it uh, this year, and that's a blessing. And uh, so praise the Lord for that. And we got folks that uh, go through it and, and discern whether the Sun and Shield is their place. And, uh, and uh, I I'll hope the Lord adds to the church uh, daily with salvations, but also uh, as well as joining the church. And so we look forward to that. Well, I'll have the choir come and sing, and then we'll sing another song this evening. with the young people. We had 10 young people go and we had a full van and going down it was a little noisy but coming back it was very quiet as 
I noticed a number of the younger people were talking amongst themselves about what happened at the youth conference, and it was a very, very sweet time. And thank you for praying for that. If you just grab your hymnals and turn to 143, Blessed Assurance. All right, let's all stand as we'll sing page number 143, Blessed Assurance, page 143. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my song. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture, no verse on my sight. Angels descending, bring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. My Savior am happy and blessed. I'm watching and waiting. I'm looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. song, praising my Savior all the day long. One more chorus, one more time. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day seated.
Joy, would you stay there a second? I, I, I heard a song going home today that, I, uh, that I'd really like you to play. How many like the song, How Great Thou Art? I was going home today and listening to the... There's just something about that song that, uh, that speaks to your heart and, uh, and things. I thought they were just, it was just instrument. Would you play that song for us tonight? And then, uh, then I, I've got, my dad's going to come and, and preach for us tonight. Uh, I've needed some help. I, I, I don't, pastors need help just like everybody else does too. And, uh, and dad's, dad's been here to help me. And, he, and I, I've got some other things I'll share with you in the future. But, uh, but I appreciate him being willing to step in and, and, uh, and, and help me and be an encouragement to me. And I'm thankful for it. And so he's going to come and preach in a moment. But, uh, but I thought about that song this morning, I, this afternoon going home. And I was like, that would be a great song to hear. And I was going to ask you to play it. And so if you'll play that song for us tonight, that would be great. And, and make it big. Do whatever you've got to do. Make it big. That would be awesome. And if you want to hum along, it would be all right, too. I don't think it will be a problem. But, uh, but if you'll play that song, then dad come and preach to us what God's laid on your heart. First time Joy has ever been at the piano. <laughs> I tell you, anybody who's ever played an instrument knows how much time it takes. And um, praise the Lord, you can tell she puts her heart into playing the piano. It's a real blessing. It prepares our hearts 
for the Word of God. Take your Bibles tonight. Turn with me to the book of Psalms. Psalm chapter number 91. Psalm chapter number 91. A wonderful portion of Scripture to encourage us and to help us tonight. Psalm chapter 91. If you'd please stand as we read. Psalm chapter 91. I count it a privilege to be able to be with you here. And the Lord has seen for us to uh, be here for a while. And let's get a chance to know some of you. And, and, and I know some of you are kind of ornery. But, you know... Uh, we're watching for like Brother Scott. We know how he is, and and uh, but uh, you know it's it's good to laugh. You know, uh, there's so much in this world that you look at, and and uh, like Brother Doug said, you know, it can be kind of a downer. But as Christians, we have life in Jesus Christ. He's come to give us life and to give it more abundantly. And if anybody ought to be rejoicing, it ought to be us. Hey, we're getting ready to go out of here pretty soon. And as I listen to the things that are happening in the news. Uh, I, I just get, get excited because I got one leg up. I'm ready to go. You know, the Lord's going to, that trumpet's going to sound and we're going to be out of here. And what a joy that's going to be. Psalm chapter 91, follow along as I read. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. And from the noisome pestilence, he shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in thy hand, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder and the young lion and the dragon, Shalt thou trample under feet, because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him, and I will be with him in trouble, and I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Let's pray. Our precious God, we are so grateful to have the word of God. What encouragement and joy it brings to the heart of those who know you as their Savior. Lord, it brings peace. It brings contentment. It gives us understanding. It gives us hope. And Lord, we know that one day we're going to see the living word, your Son, our Jesus Christ, our Savior, who's going to come to take us home, to enjoy all the things that you have for us. But until then, Father, we need to keep our eyes focused upon you. And Lord, to be serving you and surrendering our life to you, to give the very best we have so that others might hear the gospel. And Lord, that people might be encouraged to look to you. Father, tonight, I know that in myself there's no good thing. But I know that you are a wonderful God, and people need to see the Savior tonight. And I pray that your Spirit would guide my words, and Lord, that you'd fill me with your power. And Lord, for those that are hurting tonight, those that need to be comforted, Lord, I pray for your blessing and hand upon them. I think tonight of Brian, who just lost some loved ones this past week. I pray, God, for mercy for him and comfort for the family. And Lord, that you'd work in that that life and that situation. Lord, for others here in this church, Father, may you do a work in their life tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. you may be seated. One of the games that I liked, to, I liked to play as a young boy, and I know that was many years ago, one of the games I liked to play was kick the can. And how many remember playing kick the can? You can remember that game. Uh, one person was the it. 
And uh, that person who was it, uh, they would have to count to 100, while, uh, you know, close their eyes, count to 100 while everybody else went and hi hid someplace. Some would hide real close and they would think that once the person was done counting the, and they started going to try to find the other people that you know, remember they used to have the can up there and you had to go over and jump over and say, one, two, three on so and so. And, and if you jumped over the can, then that person was out and they had to sit and wait until the last person was caught and then that person was the it. Some people would be real close and they would be, they'd just go just a little ways away from where the person was so, they, so that when that person they would, sometimes they would hide right behind their back and they'd wait for them to take a few steps off and then they would come and say, one, two, three, free, and everybody, or they'd kick the can and everybody would be free. And then that person had to count all over again to 100. Some people would go a far distance away. They'd go a long distance away because they figured that they could outrun that person if they had the distance to get there and they could maybe run and, and uh, get free, kick the can, and they'd be set free. Others would look for a special place, a secret place where, where no one would find them. And if you were really good friends, that person might show you that secret place where you could be safe from being caught. In our text, the psalmist mentions a secret place. And tonight we are going to examine what the Bible has to say about the secret place of God. We need to ask ourselves a question. Do I know where the secret place is? Do I know where the secret place is? Do I even care? Do I even care about this secret place? And what are the benefits of knowing and abiding in this secret place? I want you to see, first of all, as we consider this portion of Scripture, the place is referred to as the secret place, notice, of God. The secret place of God. Go back to verse number 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That word secret in the Hebrew, it's the idea of covering, a sheltered, a hiding place, a secret place. But I want you to know it as you look at this portion, it is the secret place of the Most High. It's not a secret place of men's choosing, but it, rather it's a secret place of God's choosing. Today we hear people when, say when things go, get tough or rough, uh, I went to my what? Happy place. I went to my happy place. You say, well, what do you mean they went to their happy place? Well, they went in their mind to a place that uh, brought joy or, or uh, that might be uh, where they out, were off fishing someplace on a, on a nice lake that's nice and calm. And, and they were sitting there with their pole in the water and, and they were catching fish and, and they were just thinking about that. They would go to their secret place. My wife used to work for a, 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 a principal of a school. And he was a Buddhist, had been a Buddhist monk, and he decided to be a principal. Wow, what a change. Uh, and when the kids, my, my wife would have to work with, uh, she was the secretary and had to work with discipline. So when the kids would have to be disciplined for cutting school or cheating or those type of things, they had to call the parents and, and they'd have to write up all these slips and they'd give it to the, the principal and then he would, he would call the parents in and then they would discuss it. And uh, when he'd get to, he would, uh, she would have these different re, uh, request slips for him to talk to the kids and she'd give them to him and he'd go into his, he'd go into his uh, uh, office and he'd start hum. He was going into his his home place, his secret place where he's meditating, uh, and he wouldn't do anything. He would go into his secret place. Maybe you have a, a place where you say, well, man, I had vacation time, and it was such a wonderful time. I can remember when I was on the... I was on the beach or I was up in the mountains and it was just a beautiful time. It was a way, there's no noise, there's, no, uh, there's nothing uh, that, that was uh, uh, out there. In fact, I was thinking today, I'm glad I'm in Arizona right now rather than in Montana because this is usually the smoky time of the year. This is when the fires start and, and you, you know, we had at one time we had to go and put duct tape on the doors and around the doors because the smoke was coming through the, uh, the house. And I, so I'm glad I'm not in Montana right now. Although I called one of the guys the other day and he said, you know, we're getting frost on the ground. That means snow's right around the corner. 
But we can think of those type of places when I was a pastor in California. And my wife wanted to redecorate my office. She said, what would you like to do? And I thought, you know, I went into a store and they had murals. And I thought they had a mural of a grist mill. And I mean, it was, it was huge. And they put up the, I said, honey, I'd like to have that on one of my walls. And so I had this huge grist mill and, and they had all this uh, foliage and, and there was a river, that, a stream that was going down there. It, it reminded me when I was in, uh, as a child, uh, we went to a, a place that was just like that. The people had, they, rent, they made their own uh, electricity by the, the water and everything. And I thought, man, it was so quiet, so peaceful. And there'd be times I'd sit there in my desk when things would get so, uh, so hard and I could picture myself in that little corner right there, uh, just sitting there listening to that, that, that uh, water wheel going. Just your mind would go out of that. And we stop and we think about places like that. But I, I want you to consider as we look at this portion of Scripture that this secret place of which we are talking in verse number 1 is God's secret place. Notice the words once again. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. You say, Pastor Walker, where is the secret place? Well, turn with me to Psalm chapter 27 and verse number 5. Consider what David says. Psalm 27 and verse number 5. He says, For in the time of trouble, he, talking of God, shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall hide me Upon a rock. In the secret place of his ta- uh, secret place, the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. Barnes says of this portion of scripture, he says, In the secret of his tabernacle is the most retired and private part of his dwelling place. He would not merely admit him to his premises, not only to the vestibule of the, the house. Not only to the open court or to the parts of his house frequented by the rest of his family, but he would admit him to the private apartments, the place to which he himself withdrew to be alone, and where no stranger, not even one of his family, would venture to intrude. Nothing could be more certainly denoted friendship. Uh, nothing could, uh, could more certainly make uh, pr- protection sure than thus to be taken into the private apartment where the master of the family was accustomed himself to withdraw, that he might be alone. And nothing, therefore, can more beautifully describe the protection which God will give to his friends than the idea of thus admitting them to the secret apartments of his own dwelling place. Look at Psalm 32, verse 27. Psalm 32 and verse 27, excuse me, Psalm 32, verse 7. Here we see David really getting down to where it is. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance, Selah. We think. Sometimes that we can run to the house of God and there is a place that is God's secret place. I think of Athaliah who ran to the house of God when she heard that she was going to be put to death. And she grabbed a hold of the horns. Joab did the same thing. He thought, boy, there, uh, the house of God, that's the secret place. That's a place where, where there's protection. Remember, because of their evil and their their sinful ways, there was no protection there. But I submit to you the the secret place of which Psalm 91 speaks about. That secret place of the Lord is the Lord himself. You, You say, Pastor Walker, that doesn't make sense. The secret place is the Lord himself. Yes. You know, there's people that would run to a building... Instead of running to the Lord. We've heard of hurricanes and we've seen the tornadoes and different places where 
They've come and decimated the places of worship. Can I share with you? People lose hope. People lose their joy. But may I share with you that there is a, there is a secret place. A secret place. The secret place of God. Not my choosing. My hope is not in this building. My hope and my peace is in my God. If this building's gone tomorrow, hey, we have a reason to rejoice because we still have our God. Our health may be gone tomorrow. You say, well, I can't get to church. I believe we ought to be in church. It's a great place to be, to be able to encourage one another, to, to share our burdens and our needs and to lift up our hands one together and, and serve. And, and that's how we have joy in using our spiritual gifts. That's what God planned for us. But may I share with you, there is still a secret place that if you lose all your health and lose your ability to be in the house of God, there is a secret place, the secret place of God, that you can still go to. You can go there day or night because it's the Lord himself. The Lord himself. So where is the Lord right now? Psalm chapter 11, verse number 4. Look there. Psalm chapter 11, verse number 4. I was thinking of the account of Job and when everything was taken from Job, remember all of his wealth, all the things that he had and, and uh, his family and, and all that was taken and even his health and he was uh, looking for God because he just wanted to ask God a few questions. Why, Lord? What's going on? What have I done? What? He's trying to figure all of this out. And he says, I can see God work over there, and I can see God work over there. Can I tell you something? God was not only working there and working there, he was working right there in Job's heart. God says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Can I share with you? God never does. And though we may not understand what God's doing, God is still working. He works through trials and struggles in our life. Psalm 11, verse number 4, it says this. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. The Lord's in his holy temple. The Lord is in his holy temple right now. I, I praise God that our God is in his holy temple. He's never going to have to worry about being abdicated. Satan tried that. It didn't work. He got kicked out like lightning. May I share with you that our God is forever on his throne. He is forever there. And you can trust and you can bank your life on the God of the word of God. That he's going to be there for you tomorrow. He's not going to change. There's not going to be a difference with God. You can trust him. He's faithful. Hebrews chapter 1 verse number 1. Hebrews chapter 1 in the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 1. Book of Hebrews is a wonderful portion of Scripture. A lot of people stay away from Hebrews, but you ought to get into it because there's some deep truths that will help you and uh, enlighten your eyes to the truth of God's Word and how God works. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 says, God, who at sundry or various times and in diverse or various manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son." Whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he hath made the worlds. Who being the brightness of his glory, the expressed image of his person. And upholding all things by the word of his power. Jesus is upholding all things by the word of his power. He's holding all of these worlds together. I listened to India applauding themselves for being able to drop a rover on the moon and Boy, we're going to populate the moon. No, we're not. You say, well, you're pretty sure about that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure about that because I read the book. A lot of money's wasted. It's like sending space capsules out there for intelligent life out there someplace. Hey, there's not any intelligent life on any other planet than here. Because God said he made the earth to be inhabited. He didn't make the other planets. And one day, those other planets out there, God says, he's just going to say, Luo. Be loosed. And all those elements are going to, those atoms are just going to go apart. And they're going to burn up with a fervent heat. That's going to be a big bang. I believe in the big bang. 
It didn't start, it didn't happen way back then, but it's going to happen in the future because God's word says it will. Can you imagine? We had the atomic bomb with just one little atom being let go. All the atoms in these chairs, all the atoms in the rocks, and the, all of a sudden, he's holding all that together. And he's going to say in one moment, be loosed, and it's going to be done. He's going to create a new heaven, a new earth. What a wonderful thing that's going to be. But here in this portion of Scripture, he goes on to say in verse number 3, notice what he goes on to say. And when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The Lord is in heaven. The Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, is there in heaven right now. When we receive Jesus as our Savior, we were given the right to enter into his very throne room. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Romans chapter 5 and verse number 1. Paul speaking to the Roman believers. Therefore being justified, that word justified means simply declared righteous. When you got saved, when I got saved, it's a picture of here's the judge. We're sitting over here and the case has been brought against us. We all know that we're sinners. When we're we come to that place and we realize we're a sinner and we realize that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He was buried and rose again the third day and the judge says, you're declared righteous. It's once and for all. Forever. Well, you know, pastor, I don't believe that that, you know, I got to get saved all over again. Well, you haven't read the book. You understand. When he declared you righteous, it was once and for all. You can't lose your salvation. You're not kept by your own power. You're kept by his power. And our hope and our joy and our peace is in him. He says, therefore, being justified, declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope and the glory of God. Because we're saved, we are able to come into, into the throne room of God. Look at Hebrews. Go back there again. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. Because we are saved, because Jesus has, we have peace with God, our sins are forgiven. Verse 16, what a joy. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, I've got to be honest with you. I don't feel worthy to come into the throne room of grace. See, I know me. I know that I'm just, we were working on, the choir's working on a song. I'm a sinner saved by grace. And the more you see and understand the holiness of God, the more you see yourself of who you really are. And it's all, if any good thing ever comes out of you or me, it's because of him. And we give him the glory and we give him the praise because he's our rock. He's our hiding place. He's the one that has done a good work in us and will do so until he takes us home. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It seems that the last place that people run to in time of trouble is to the Lord rather than the first place. When things are frustrating, they run to Facebook and social media. Well, I want to tell you about all the problems I had at work and all the problems I have at home and all the mom and dad are not giving me what I want and I, I want those $150 tennis shoes and, and I want to be able to do this. And I want, hey, folks, can I tell you something? Get off of social media. Well, I've got a following. You do not. You just got some lurkers that want to lurk and find out and, and spread all the gossip about you. Some people, when, they, when, they're, uh, when things get hard, they run to their friends for comfort. When disappointments come and things don't work out the way they hope, people turn to strangers for help and encouragement. Folks, we can turn to good godly Christians and find encouragement. As Pastor mentioned this morning about Jonathan, he encouraged David in the Lord when David was 
having rough times. He said, you know, I'm only one step from death. Because Jonathan's daddy was wanting, wanting to kill him. Not for anything bad that David had done, but just for doing good. Paul encouraged Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.7. He says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. And Timothy, in that portion of scripture, as you go back and you study the, the history of that, Timothy uh, was going through a time when he would, uh, Paul would send him to different places to get churches squared away. And, and, you know, being a troubleshooter is not always easy. And people don't always like it when you have to say, well, this is what God says you need to do. And you're not doing that. You need to do that so that things can get corrected. Well, Paul had sent Timothy over and over again to churches to be his ambassador, to help those churches to get on the right track. And, and Timothy at this point was a little bit on the shaky side. And Paul says, I just want you to know, Timothy, God has not given us a, a spirit of fear, of timidity, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Our God is the God you need to be looking to. Don't be fearful. We may turn to good Christian uh, Christian friends to encourage us but can I share with you there is a secret place where we can always turn the secret place of God where we can find help encouragement safety and peace there is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God a place where sin cannot molest near to the heart of God O oh, Jesus, blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God, hold us who wait before Thee near to the heart of God. Psalm 16, verse 11, it says, I, uh, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In Thy presence is fullness of joy. At Thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Have you found God's secret place are you trying to find some other place to hide to find safety to find peace jesus said in john 16 turn over there with me to john chapter 16 for just a moment john 16 and verse 33 if you're looking to the world for your peace you won't find it Jesus said, these things I have spoken unto you, he's talking to the disciples, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. In me you'll have peace. In me. Why is it such a, a difficult thing to get into the word of God and to study and to, and to memorize the, the, the precious promises as we were talking about just a moment ago? Why is it so hard for us? Why is there such opposition, it seems like, for us to be able to do that and to get into that? Because Satan knows that if you understand that there is a place, a secret place, where you can run to and find peace and joy then you'll be a Christian who's got power in your life and you will not be easily moved because you've got a God who never changes and you can still produce fruit no matter what the season, no matter what the season. I want you to see as we look back at Psalms, Psalm 91 that God grants to those who dwell in his secret place his shadow of protection. Go back there to Psalm chapter 91. God grants to those who dwell in his secret place his shadow of protection. We see that in verses, the second part of verse number 1 down to verse 13. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with fe his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler and thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night nor for the arrow that flieth by day nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side and Ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. 
Folks, may I share with you today as we stop and think about that, it's not enough just to know where the secret place of God is. We must dwell there in order to be under the shadow of the Almighty. The word dwell means to remain, to sit, to abide, and to stay. This is not just a touch and go, but rather it's a choice to continue to remain. This is my choice to remain with my God all the time. There are a lot of Christians that the amount of time they spend with God is only on Sunday for an hour. Or maybe on Sunday and Wednesday. Over the 44 plus years that I've been in the ministry, I've seen growth in Christians. The people who spend a little bit of time hearing the preaching of God's word and praying and And those type of things, they grow a little. And that's exciting to see a little bit of growth. But there's others who say, you know what, I I just can't seem to get enough. I want to know more about Jesus. More about Jesus would I know. More of his grace to others show. I want to know more about the Lord. I want to, you're like a sponge and they just want to get more. Just tell me more about the the Lord that that, that created me. Tell me more about the God who who loves me. Tell me about uh, what he wants for me to do and how he wants me to, uh, to walk and to live. And as you share the word of God, they just take it all in. And it's not just take it all in. They decide in their life from this point forward, no matter what God says, I am going to do. That's what he's talking about, abiding. When we come to the conclusion that God is right all the time. And if God says something in his word, God is right. Even if it goes contrary to what I believe. You know, when I was growing up, I had my parents tell me some things that, you know, they loved the Lord, they loved the things of God, and it gave me an example to follow, but some of the things that they said were not exactly in accordance as I studied the Bible for myself was not what the Bible said. And I had to make a choice. Who am I going to believe? And am I going to believe a God who cannot lie? Titus 1, 2. It's impossible for God to tell a lie. Or will I believe what my parents said? Now, I love my parents. I thank the Lord for his sacrifice, for what they taught me. You want to get out of depression and get out of of feeling uh, down. Can I tell you one of the things that will help you? Start counting your blessing. Just start saying, just start, you know, start when the devil starts and knocks on your door and say, hey, you know what? Boy, this is a bad day. Things are going really tough. Okay, Lord, I just want to thank you for my house. I want to thank you for my wife. I want to thank you for my children. I want to thank you for my grandchildren. I want to thank you for the food. I want to thank you for my health. You just start doing that and you'll watch and see how Satan starts falling farther and farther to the background because you start seeing a great God. If you will do that all the time, you'll start seeing God's power over those type of things. You'll start seeing a change in your life. But here in this portion of Scripture, we, as, we, as we stop and we think about uh, God, God is good all the time. He's right all the time. I had to choose, yes, I love my parents, but I love my God more. And my God is always right. And I may not always be going the right way, but I'm telling you right now, I've settled in my heart, God is always right. And I need to get my act together. And I need to turn around. And I need to, because see... I want to be able to be in the secret place. And the secret place is where my God is. He is my hope. As David said, he is my hiding place. This is not just a place where I'm going to touch and go, but this is a place where I'm going to put down my roots. May I share with you that tonight no one can decide for you to dwell in the secret place of the Most High. You can't live on borrowed convictions. You know, I, there's a difference between belief and convictions. And there are a lot of people that live 
in a Christian home and they've heard the preacher preach and they've heard mom and dad say, well, the Bible says and, and give them scripture references and, and they, they say, yeah, I believe that, I believe that. There's a difference though between belief and conviction. Conviction is I've got a, a direction that I'm going because of the belief that I have. And we live in a day when people don't want to have any convictions. People say, you know what, you just need to be silent. You need to be quiet because you're going to offend somebody. Pastor talked a little bit about that this morning. The new morality is nothing more than the old immorality, my friend. Just a new name, a new face. It hasn't, it hasn't changed. It's still the same old stuff. My parents used to own a Christian bookstore. And, the Christian, uh, and, and as you go in the, the bookstores of the world, you go in the bookstores of the world and the, the place where they would have Christian literature, now they have the occult. Well, it's the same stuff. No, it's not the same stuff. New Age movement, folks, for people that are involved in the New Age, and there's a lot of people and a lot of so-called Christians getting caught up in the New Age movement. The crystals and, and uh, acupuncture and all those. So, Brother Walker, you, you're talking about things that I really hold on to. When I was a youth pastor, one of the things that, that uh, you know, those gel bands that kids wear, one of, the, one of the parents came up and, and I, was, uh, talking, uh, I was talking with some parents and they said, do you know, some kids were wearing the different colored gel bands and, and they said, do you know what those gel bands are about? You ought to do some research and find out what those things are about. Because I just thought, well, they're cutesy and kids do different things. Uh, some of those gel bands talk about sexual activities that they, if you wear a certain colored gel band, then you're going to be willing to do that. And Christian parents were letting their kids do that putting those things on, and they didn't have a clue what was going on. That's why, parents, you need to be watching what your kids are on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat. Why do you think they put it on Snapchat? So that they can put something on there without you knowing about it for very long. It'll be gone. You'd be surprised at what Christian kids are putting on there. Had one of the young ladies in our church she had gone to with one of the other folk that was supposed to be a mature Christian and uh, they uh, these two folk went out to go get some uh, dresses or try on some dresses and they were trying on some dresses and they took pictures of the dresses and some of them were immodest and then they thought they'd be funny and you know what they did they posted it on Facebook one of the folk in our church just so happened to be going through Facebook and came up with a picture of this young lady. And she was one who was working in, with our young people. She was working on the bus ministry. We had to call her in and say, hey, excuse me. Called Daddy in. Said, did you know about this? Daddy was shocked. He had no clue. He didn't know about using a cell phone with pictures. I mean, he was the old flip phone. You know what I'm talking about? You know, the flip phone, the, you, don't, you, don't, you can't do texting, you can't, you just, the old flip phone, that's all you got it for. When he saw his daughter on there, I said, you know, we have to do some things here. She has to step down from her place of responsibility. Because she was being a bad example for those that were around. May I share with you, she's not only affecting them or herself, but she was affecting others, other young people. Can I tell you tonight, folks? Dwelling in the presence, dwelling in the secret place of God, you've got to be walking with God. It's not just enough about knowing about Jesus. God is love and, and God, you know, he loves us. He's a creator. He's holy. Jesus is the son of God. He died for our sins, was buried, rose again. Good teacher, someone, you know, someone to turn to in time of help. May I share with you the people that he's talking about here in Psalm 91, verse 1. He that dwelleth, he remains, he abides in the secret place of God. That's where I want to stay. Let me ask you, do you like to be in the secret place of God? These folk are acquainted they were mentioned just knowing about them. They, they're acquainted with biblical principles, but they have not, they're not allowing God to guide their life on a daily basis. There's no conviction to that. 
those who have chosen to dwell, not just a belief, but convictions that remain and stay in the secret place of God, seeking his face in making decisions, living a life controlled by his spirit, they shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So what does that mean? Well, the idea here is one of protection and comfort and safety. Look at verse number four. It kind of gives us a metaphor here. It says, he shall cover thee with his feathers. Talking about God. Now, God does not have feathers. It's a personification. Here, he's trying to help you to, he's trying to paint a picture for you and for me. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. The picture here is of, of a chicken with chicks. We used to raise chickens when, we, when I was a boy, and we had uh, banny roosters, and, or banny chickens and, and roosters and, and on a little farm that my parents had. And, boy, I'll tell you what, those little banny, how many have ever had any banny chickens? You ever, ever had those? Boy, I'll tell you what, they may be small, but I'll tell you what, they can be mean as a snake. I mean, uh, you know, they'll go out there and they'll peck around and stuff like that, but when they have a brood of little chicks... And you go around, and you know, kids, sometimes kids like to play around and throw rocks at them. And boy, I'll tell you what, you don't want to do that with a mother banny hen. She'll just, she'll come after you. I remember one time that, that there, was a, there was an animal that was, uh, a, I think it was a cat or something like that, that was by our chicken coop. And uh, boy, all of a sudden, the, the mom had a whole bunch of little chicklet, uh, chickens, and, and they were out there, and they were, the, they were, uh, just doing all sorts, and she started calling them, and boy, all of a sudden, they came in, and underneath, uh, they got underneath her, her wings, and she sat down, and she just looked at that cat, and was sitting there, you just try it, I'll peck your eyes out, <laughs> man, I'm telling you, and that cat just backed off, man, it, it wasn't going to mess with it, you know, she'd do that, and boy, you know, that cat knew that you, you better not mess with this thing, the story is told of a farmer who had a, had a barn, and caught on fire. He went out to survey the damage. And he noticed all the equipment and the things that were destroyed. And he noticed over in the corner there was kind of a kind of little pile over there. And he went over and started uh, kind of brushing things away to see what it was. And it was the hen that was there and uh, had died there in that, in that fire. And he turned and was getting ready to walk away. And as he turned, he noticed that he saw some movement underneath that hen. And he started hearing little chirping. And he went over and he lifted up the hen. And underneath that, that mother hen was all these little baby chicks that went for safety and security, went under mama, and they were spared. But mama left, lost her life. You know, that kind of pictures for us about Jesus Christ when he talked about Jerusalem, the nation of Israel. Turn with me, if you would, in the New Testament as Jesus talks about his attitude for them in Luke chapter 13. And I submit to you tonight that God has this same type of attitude. God loves you. God wants you to draw close to him. He created you for fellowship. God is all sufficient. He doesn't need anything, but he wants fellowship with you. And no one can, can meet your need like him. And when you're not where you need to be, in the secret place of the Most High, you're missing out, but so is God. He's missing out on your worship and your love and your adoration. And here in this portion of Scripture, look what God says here in this portion of Scripture in Luke chapter 13, verse number 34. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets, and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. May I share with you, there's... One who wants you to meet with him every day. Not only every day, at the beginning of the day. Can I tell you? He wants you to meet with him throughout the day. As you're going through your day, you're taking tests, you know, 
He wants you to talk to him and say, hey, I, God, I, I love you. Because see, in John 15, 5, God, Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. He wants you to come to the place where you come to him and say, Lord, I need your help on this test today. Lord, I need your help as I'm going through this trial. Lord, I, I, just, want, I just want to come to you and tell you, I love you. He wants you to walk and talk with him throughout the day. He said, just as a mother hen, O Israel, doth pull her little chicks to herself. That's what I wanted to do. But God has given us a choice. And Israel said, I will not. It's a matter of their will. It's not that they didn't know. It's a matter that they won't. There's a lot of Christians today, they, you know what, what God wants you to do, but you've chosen not to draw close to Him. You've allowed sin in your life in a particular area, or you've allowed this situation over here. God is, maybe God's called you to the mission field. I don't know. Maybe God said, you know, this is where you need to go. This, this area right here, I've been calling you for a long time. And you said, I understand, but I'm not going to. It's not a matter you don't know. It's a matter that you're not willing. Jesus gave his life for us that we might live. We are safe in him. 1 John chapter 5, verse 11. And this is the record that God hath given unto us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son hath hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. That you may believe in the name of the Son of God. Just like that hen spared the life of those chickens. May I share with you when Jesus gave up his life he gave us life. We have life today because of him. What if we choose not to follow God's principles for our life? And you know, all of us have that choice. We can choose not to abide in the secret place with God. That place, it doesn't even make sense. Why would we not want to dwell in a place where there's peace? Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Why would we not want to stay in the place with God? Why not... Why would we not want to spend time with God throughout the day and, and have communion with God and spend, uh, draw close to Him in, in, in the days of our life? You say, Pastor Walker, I've got so much to do. I don't have time to do all that. We don't have time not to do that. What if we choose not to do that? Will we lose our salvation? The answer is no. Jesus said in John 10, 28... I, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. If I'm a sheep, the reason why some people don't want to follow Jesus is simple. They, they're not his sheep. And I'm convinced in churches today, we've got a lot of people who claim to be Christians, and you spend a lot of time trying to get them to do things that Christians should do, and the reality is they're not even safe. They don't want to know. They want to be in the house of God. They don't want to read their Bible. They, don't, they would rather complain. They'd rather gripe. They'd rather go in the way of the world. And you're spending all this time trying to treat them like Christians when in reality they don't have a desire for things of God. Can I tell you something? Jesus put it very clearly. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Bottom line, if I'm a child of God, I want to follow him. I want to be in his presence. I want to be where he is. And I give unto them, Jesus said, eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. We will not lose our salvation, but what we will lose is our peace of God. The peace of God. See, when we got saved, the Lord, God declared us righteous. We have peace with God as we saw in Romans 5.1 but we can lose the peace of God. God's peace. Look with me to Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. And there is a difference between peace with God and the peace of God. There are a lot of Christians today that do not have the peace of God. 
Why? Well, it's very simple. They're not abiding in the secret place of the Most High. They're abiding in the world. In the world, you're going to have tribulation. You're going to have trouble in the world. You live for the world. You live in the world. You're going to, the Bible says the way of a transgressor is hard. You can just mark it down. But those who dwell in the secret place of the Most High, they dwell where God is. They want God in their life and they seek His face and they desire to walk with Him and let Him guide their path. You're going to have peace. The Bible says in Philippians 4, 6, be careful or be anxious for nothing. Do you ever get anxious? I had cancer a couple years ago and I've got to admit, I, I got a little anxious. If some of you have had that, um, you just kind of start evaluating your life pretty quickly because the C word kind of, you never know what, that your life could be done. You never know what God's got in store. Could be the, could be the end. And uh, my daily walk, I try to walk with God. I try to do what He wants. And, uh, you know, I got a little anxious. But then this verse comes to mind, Be careful, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Hey, the place that's going to give you peace is the secret place of the Most High. That's why Satan fights so hard to keep you from going there. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, there be any praise, think on these things, those things which ye have both uh, learned and heard, uh, excuse me, learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Why is it that we don't have peace? Well, we've lost the peace of God because we're going a different direction from God. When we choose not to follow God's principles, we come out from under God's umbrella of protection. And because God loves us, he has promised that he will chasten us to get us back onto the right path. Go to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 5. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 5. I'm amazed at Christians who tempt God. They know Jesus as their Savior. They are confident of the fact that Jesus died for their sins. They're confident of that. But they want to live to see and test God to see how much he really loves them. I had a gentleman, that's what he would say. I just want to see how much God really loves me. And he knew that God would chasten him. I said, man, you are crazy. Don't you realize your breath is in his hand? Your life is in his hand. I know but I just want to see if God really loves me. Wow. Hebrews 12, 5 says, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which uh, speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son, son whom he receiveth. Hey, folks, as a Christian, you are going to receive chastening. So am I. Chastening comes for two reasons. Number one, for sin, walking wrong. But can I tell you something? Chastening sometimes comes, not because of sin in your life, but because God wants to strengthen your faith. We see that in the life of Job. He went through trials, did he not? It wasn't to destroy him. When he went through the fire, he came out on the other side. He said, and Job even said, he said, when I come out, I'll be, when God has tried me, I'll come forth as gold. God's desire is for us to be stronger in our faith. And he knows the trials and the struggles that need to come your way to make you to be the best, to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. If you endure chasing, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if he be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, 
then are you bastards or illegitimate, not sons. If you, don't have, if you can go out and sin and, and live like the devil and do the things of the world, and you can live that way and God doesn't spank you, can I tell you something? <laughs> you better get concerned. Because you're not a child of God. It's not what I'm saying, it's what God says. Because God promises he's going to chase you. And you know, you can go one step further. In 1 John, it talks about the fact if you won't, you know, if you don't listen to the chastening, then God says there is a sin unto death. And God says, okay, you're done. I'm taking you home. I don't want to walk in that way. I want to stay as far, as far away as, from that as I can. I want, to, I want to be in the secret place of God. I want to be where my God is so that I have his peace, I have his strength, I have his comfort. Have you come out from underneath the umbrella of God's protection? Are you seeking to live your life your way? Proverbs 13, 15, good understanding, giveth fa- uh, good understanding giveth favor, but the way of the transgressors is hard. Why not repent and get back under God's umbrella? But I want to see finally, as we close tonight, seven rewards of dwelling in the secret place of God. Look back at Psalm 91 very quickly. Here's seven listed here, just very, very short and to the point. Seven rewards for dwelling in the secret place of God. We see them listed in verse number 14 down to verse 16. Because he, talking of the man that, that, that abides under the, or excuse me, that dwells in the secret place here in verse number 14... He has set his love upon me, upon God. Therefore will I deliver him. God promises deliverance. But you know, God doesn't always deliver the way that we want. When I'm thinking of deliverance, if I'm going through a hard test, I think the best way of deliverance is what? For God to take, pick me up and move me someplace else. But I think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the place of deliverance for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was not for God to pick them up when when Nebuchadnezzar said, uh, if you don't bow down and worship the idol, then uh, you're going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. Uh, Now, I'm going to give you one more chance, guys. You didn't understand, I guess, maybe. But but just just bow down and worship my golden image and, and it'll all be okay. And you won't go into the fiery furnace. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, hey, we're not careful to answer you concerning this. Our God who we serve can deliver us. There's no doubt. I I know one thing. The God who created all this world can do whatever he says and whatever he wants. There's nothing too hard for him. Now the question is, what is his plan? And that's what they said. Our God can deliver us. But if not... And sometimes that if not is not always the easy road. We're not going to fall down, they said, and we're not going to worship your golden image. And they got, they were picked, they were bound up and they were thrown into the fiery furnace. And, and, you know, here they are in the fiery furnace. God says, I'll deliver you, but they didn't, he didn't deliver them. Oh, yeah, he did. In fact, he came down and walked with them. A Christophanes, Christ appearance in the Old Testament. Could you imagine? Here their chains fall off and Jesus comes down and walks and talks with them. Well, what, what a deliverance. Because see, that deliverance had an impact on not only themselves, but on the people that saw what God was able to do. The impossible. 1 Corinthians 10.13 It's a great verse. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted, allow you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape, that ye may be able to what? Bear it. You know, God's deliverance sometimes is you being able to bear the test or the trial that you're going through. His grace is sufficient for you. And he'll deliver you. And you get to the other side, you say, you know what? My God is good. There's 
My God has been faithful over here, and he's been faithful over here. He didn't remove me from that struggle and that trial. But you know what? I'm, my faith is a whole lot stronger now because of this. Because over here, you're going to have a trouble and a trial and a struggle that's going to be greater. But you needed this to prepare you for this. Those who dwell under the shadow of the Almighty, God says he will, he will uh, have a deliverance. Notice verse 14, he says, Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high. That, that idea of setting on high, uh, is interesting, Benson in his uh, commentary said this, he'll set him in a safe place where no evil can reach him. You know, when you're in heaven with your God, there's not a place where Satan can reach you. Now, they could take you and put you in a little room. I don't like little rooms. Some of you like the MRIs. Or the MR, is it MRIs? Yeah, where they put you in, they strap you in, and you got this little thing right up here against you know, your face. And, and you know, I just have to close my, mind, close my eyes and start quoting Scripture because and, and, this thing is sitting here in front of my... I don't like that type of stuff. But you know what? I can go to my secret place where my God is, and I can have peace. Folks, people can hurt your body. And that's what Jesus said. They can destroy this body. Don't worry about the people that can destroy this body. Be concerned about him that can destroy your body in hell. Hey, there's a God. There is a secret place for us. I think of some of our Christian brothers and sisters that have been beheaded around the world for the cause of Jesus Christ. They're, it's being done all over the world today. He will set us on high. Notice verse 15, he will answer our prayer. He says, he shall call upon me and I will answer him. Hey, the person who dwells in the secret place of the Most High, your prayers will be answered because you're in close fellowship with him. You know, when sin gets in our life, Psalm 66, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. But when I'm in the secret place of the Most High, I'm with him my thoughts are with him. He's in my life, working in my life, and his spirit is guiding me. I'm seeking his face. God, what would you have me to do? How would you have me to act? What would you have, how would you have me to, to work with my children and teach my children? What would you have me to do on the job? How would you have me to be on the job site? Folks, do you realize that Christians ought to be the best workers possible? And it's a travesty when Christians are lazy. It's a travesty to the name of God. God will honor us, or excuse me, God will be with us in trouble. Look at verse 15, the second part. He, he shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. Hey, God will be with us in trouble. See, when we come out from underneath the umbrella of God's protection and we're in trouble over here, may I share with you? You say, well, God, where are you? The question we need to ask ourselves is simply this. Have I come out from underneath God's umbrella of protection? See, when we're under God's umbrella of protection, he says, I'll be with you. He said, but he said, he'll never leave us nor forsake us. Well, that idea of leaving, he's, his spirit is still inside us, and we're grieving his spirit when we're sinning. But may I, and he will never leave us nor forsake us. In that regard, it's true. But his changing the situation is affected. By sin. You say, well, and affected by those different things. I submit to you tonight that being under the umbrella of God's protection is a great place to be. He says, He will honor us in verse number 15. I will deliver him and I will honor him. People are looking to be honored. When we lift up the Lord, He'll honor us in His time. I, I, I want to take a shortcut. Have you found out sometimes those shortcuts are not always the best? I found out sometimes those shortcuts become long cuts. I've gone onto a map and I said, you know what, I think I'm going to take this shortcut here. And I wound up taking this all the way around 
And it became like a 45 minutes longer than if I had just taken the regular cut. I took a shortcut. And GPS does not always help you. Sometimes it causes you. But God says, I'll honor you. The promise of long life is found in verse 16. And uh, with long life will I satisfy him. And notice the last part. And I will show him my salvation. God's salvation extends beyond the grave. Do you know that? God's salvation extends beyond the grave. 1 Corinthians 2 9 says, But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for him that love him. Eternal life. He says, I'm going to show you my salvation. Well, Jesus died on the cross. I'm, I'm glad he did. But he says, I want you to understand. You're going to see my salvation. There's so much more beyond this place. Do you realize, and we were talking about this, uh, I was talking today, I think it was with my grandson, and we were talking about uh, this life and the things in this life. And, but this life, in time and eternity, is going to be gone like that. God says the former things of this world, former things of this life, are going to pass away. You're not going to remember it anymore. The things that we thought were so important, not going to be important when we get there. And we're going to be with him 10,000 years. We'll just be started. Time will be no more. Life without end. As we conclude tonight, let me ask you, have you found God's secret place? Are you dwelling in that secret place? Hey, it's his secret place. Well, I'm going to go on to my secret place. Your secret place is not going to be like his secret place. And we need, as Christians, to run to his secret place because it's there we'll abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for this time and how precious your word is and how true. We think if we have lots of things, we are a success and we have um, everything that the world has to offer, that everything is, is great, but we can have all the, the things of this world and not have Jesus and not be in your secret place. And not love you. God, I pray tonight that we would stop and consider are we dwelling? Are we abiding? Have we made that decision in our life that we're going to stay in the secret place of God? so that you can teach us, so that you can instruct us, so we'll have peace and we'll have joy. Lord, I pray that your spirit would pour out understanding of your word and we will be content with remaining there. Let's all stand if we could with heads bowed, eyes closed for a moment. I've been asked if the place or not and maybe we need to get there tonight. Maybe we got going through struggles or hardship or whatever. Or maybe it's just I'm doing fine. I just need to make sure that I'm getting back to that secret place. And as the pianist begins to play the song of invitation, would you come? Would you come? Let the Lord speak to you. Maybe find that place, Lord. Help me get to that secret place where I meet with you. And you meet with me and we commune one with another. You know, I've spoken to you tonight. Would you come? Would you come? The song, There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God. We've got to get to that place. Find that place close to Him. It's His place. It's not ours. And there are definitely rewards that we find meeting at the place of Jesus and then abiding there. Choosing to remain there. God help us to remain in that secret place tonight. If God's spoken to you, would you come? The altar's for God's people. Would you come?
look this way. I was thinking about the secret place he was talking about. You know, if you and I showed up at the door of the White House and said, hey, I'd like to, I'd like to come in the White House. And there's some cool places I think I'd like to visit in the White House. One of those places I think that would be cool to visit would be the Situation Room. You hear the Situation Room? That would be kind of a cool place to go. And, uh, I, I, and now you walked up in the door and you met President Biden or his wife, whatever. And, hey, I'm here to see the Situation Room. They'd laugh at you. <laughs> no, there's only specific people that get to go to that place. And they only at certain times can go to that place. Because it is, it's a secret place. There's top secret things that happen in that place. But you know our God invites us, the God of the universe. He says, I have a secret place. And I want you to come anytime you want. You knock on the door and you, you can come on in. I, I, I thank, I'm thankful for my dad. Uh, dad was ba- busy all the time. Pastoring is a busy job. It's a busy, busy work. And they're busy all the time. But when I got to the office and I knocked on the door and I, who is it? And it's Tim. Come on in. I always could come in whenever dad was there because dad always had time for me. And our heavenly father says, hey, when you show up at the door, you want to come see my secret place? Come on. We'll meet together. And uh, what a blessing and a joy it is to be able to share that secret place with him and he with us. What a, what a blessing from the word of God tonight. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. and Let's ask the Lord to bless our, t- our evening, bless the week. And uh, I'm thankful for what God has taught us today. And, and it's been good to be in the Lord's house. And, and let's remember one another in prayer. Uh, there's folks going through some struggles and difficulties. And, and, uh, and let's pray, pray one for another. We need to do that. And then Wednesday, we have our Bible study right in here talking about discipleship and the importance about discipleship in the real church, what that looks like. And uh, so be praying about that this week. And, uh, and then be praying for a revival meeting. Lord, help us to have revival Pray for a revival speaker, uh, as well as each one of us individually, and I uh, pray the Lord does that work. I'm going to ask Brother Scott, would you come and uh, close us in a word of prayer tonight, and remember some of these uh, these requests as well. We've got folks that are sick, and they're uh, not doing uh, not doing well it's under the weather and, uh, and other things like that, and so let's remember them also in prayer tonight. Brother Scott. Let's pray. Heavenly Father and Lord, we thank you so much for the love and God in our life and Father as Pastor Walker has preached tonight Father for that secret place Lord that each one of us can go and and to seek you and Father knowing that you're there that you're listening to us and Father we ask that you just continue to help us Lord as we uh, go about our business Lord that we would never forget that place and Father we thank you for salvation that you've given us so freely and Father through your son Jesus Christ and we ask tonight that you just help each one of us Lord, though we're going through some trials and tribulations, but Lord, that uh, we know that you're there with us and that you're taking care of us. And Father, we ask that you just continue to help us, Lord, as we uh, take each day that we might look to you for the guidance and wisdom we need. Father, we ask that you be, be with us tonight. We do pray for those that are sick and they're not here, that you just touch their hearts and their lives. That, Father, that you'd heal them, that you'd bring them back into our midst. Father, we think of Jim and Dee Dee. We ask that you just continue to touch them and help them. And Father, I pray tonight that you just uh, uh, touch hearts and lives. Father, be with our pastor, uh, Sister Candace, that you just continue to watch over there. Father, now help us as we go our separate directions, that you just continue to lead and direct and guide in our lives. Forgive us where we failed you. For it's in Jesus' precious and holy name we pray, for your honor and for your glory. Amen. Amen.